Hi there. Welcome back to Little Guys, the show about little computers that are trying their best. And since I'm sort of rebooting this series, uh, for those of you who might just be tuning in, let me explain what a little guy is. It's my term for an industrial PC, not an industrial computer. That could be anything under the sun. You go into a factory or uh, into pretty much any business that has some sort of automated process somewhere in it, you could find a microcontroller, something running ARM, MIPS, who knows what with some custom software on it. I don't know anything about any of that stuff. Completely over my head. But PCs, I know PCs, and it turns out that uh, PC hardware, just ordinary x86, Intel, AMD, via CPUs, running normal operating systems like Linux and even Windows, get used for a lot more things in businesses than you'd expect. PCs, just ordinary hardware like we're all familiar with, running completely ordinary software, sometimes applications uh, that you're familiar with, sometimes just a web browser, but those are usually the boring ones, get stuffed into every imaginable nook and cranny of every imaginable type of business. And, well, a lot of people don't pay much attention to them. Usually they just get completely ignored. Nobody even acknowledges that they're there. They're usually doing something that is in itself not very exciting. And then when they're past their lifespan, they just get thrown out. And very few people bother to take them home, let alone open them up and see what might be inside. And as it turns out, an enormous amount of fascinating engineering ingenuity has gone in to making computers different so that they can do things other than sit on a desk and play Minecraft. Some little guys have genuinely unique functionality, but an awful lot of them are just, like I said, totally ordinary PCs. And the remarkable thing is that they've just been transformed into some bizarre form factor that you've never seen before. Oh yeah, about that. <laughs> this is a compact PCI machine, and that's the best name I can give it because I don't think that this ever had a name because, well, as you can see, it's quite modular in design. Um, obviously, this is built up out of a bunch of separate components, and just from the livery alone, you could tell they're from different companies. And in fact, this chassis is even modular on the back. I guess you could put more of the same back here if you wanted, but, well, right off the bat, we can see one of the strangest things about this. Two power inlets. Now, the reason for that is, while I often make jokes about little guys not being so little, and this one certainly looks like it counts, uh, the reality is that this machine is actually two machines. Well, it could be anyway. There's uh, nothing over here right now. Uh, the actual computer is all over there, but this could house two separate PCs, totally independent of one another. I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that when we open it up in a bit, but it's quite an interesting design. And from what I understand, this is one of millions of variants of the compact PCI concept that you'll find out in the world. You can see it's got the little, uh, badge along the top here identifying it. And that livery makes it look like Compact PCI is some sort of, um, you know, a, a trademarked uh, intercompatible system of components, but the reality from what I could tell is a bit different. Compact PCI is a standard. It's maintained by a group called the uh, PCI Industrial Computer Manufacturers Group, which I'm sure people call the PICMIG. Now, I have not read that spec because it's not open. It costs $750 to get the PDF, and from what I've read, you actually have to get a whole bunch of PDFs, and it's a huge pain in the ass to even understand the basics of the CPCI system, and I don't have $750 to even get started. So, I'm kind of in the dark about some of this, and because it's industrial, very few nerds have bothered to write anything down about it, and certainly nobody has pirated the documents or at least if they have, they're up on Internet Archive, which is unfortunately quite unavailable at the moment. Good luck, Internet Archive. We're pulling for you. So all I can really tell you about this thing is what it does and what little I've gleaned about it on forums, but I'll do my best. Let's start by meeting the actual PC we'll be looking at. This guy right here. This is made by a company called Ziatech. But like I said, I, I don't believe they made this chassis. And as you can see, Condor made these power supplies, so uh, I don't know if there's a larger Ziatech system that these were meant to be sold in. I have heard that a lot of uh, CPCI manufacturers do make their own chassis. And that's relevant because, you see these connectors on the back here? These closely resemble uh, what's used in a thing called VME bus, so I tend to just call them VME connectors for that reason. I don't know where they truly originated, but... VME is part of a, a very old standard called EuroCard, and I think that's where these connectors originated. I've never been entirely sure, 
But the point is, when you see these on the back of a card, you never actually know what the hell they are because they're used in so many different devices that are much like this. Uh, mainframe chassis designs where you can slot in cards and there's just a backplane in the back. So on an actual VME machine, this would be a bus for a 68,000 microprocessor. But in this case, as the name implies, this is standard PCI. Now, conventional personal computer PCI is 32-bit, and indeed, this is. But that's where things immediately start to get interesting, because we have a little sticker on here that says, permanent damage may happen if we plug this into a 64-bit chassis. Because, apparently, this connector here is not specified in any way. This part is rigidly specced. Every single CPCI device in existence don't quote me on this and don't trust me on this, is supposedly the same down here. And indeed, there are some which consist of nothing more than that plug. From what I understand, you could take this card and plug it into any CPCI chassis and it would work because it doesn't have that second plug up there. But since this one does, you could get yourself into trouble because apparently this is completely unspecified. You can do anything you want with these pins. They're all user defined. So. In this case, I believe what this is, is rear panel I.O. I'll explain more about this in a couple of minutes, but plugging things into this PC can be tough because there's not a lot of space on front for plugs. But apparently, if we had the Ziatech specialized chassis, then this upper connector would go into the back plane and that would break out to plugs on the back of it uh, so that you could uh, treat this as a hot swappable, you know, compute unit uh, and just leave all the cables plugged in if you need to pull it out and uh, do maintenance or replace it. But I get the impression that in the CPCI chassis that support 64-bit PCI, which, if you didn't know, is a thing. Uh, normally when you see it in a PC, it's just got a very, very long slot. Uh, they use this secondary connector for the other half of the bus. So it makes sense that if you were to plug this in to one of those, there could be voltages up there that go places they're not supposed to, either from this uh, towards the chassis or vice versa. So this is a bummer because... From what I understand, they're all keyed the same way. This thing does have this real funky key back here, real strange looking thing. And you can imagine in your head, uh, there's so much room there that maybe all the manufacturers would have their own unique little uh, key there so you couldn't get yourself into the situation, but it doesn't seem that way. I've looked up a lot of these things on eBay and all the ones I've seen seem to have the same key. Freaky. You, you know, I keep talking about what this plugs into. I should probably actually show it to you. Let's uh, just uh, get a camera in here. So that PCB back there is called a backplane. This is a common thing in industrial computers. You'll just have um, a motherboard, but there's no active electronics on it. It's just a way uh, for various devices to talk to each other and to get power. Uh, you'll notice that the uh, card guides down here are colored. The red one indicates that that's where you have to put the uh, compute module because uh, you can see there's this extra space on the side here. If you didn't have that, then uh, the floppy drive and hard drive modules would run into the card guides. So you've got to put the computer there. Uh, the peripherals fit in these black slots. And then the green one is for the power supply. You've got to put it there because, of course, it's got a completely unique connector. You can see that back there. So this is what you'll see in every CPCI chassis, apparently. As long as it's a 3U variant, uh, it's called that because it's literally three rack units high uh, in a standard 19-inch equipment rack, uh, but they also make a 6U version, which is twice the height, and those ones have backplanes that are twice the height. So in addition to these two connectors, they have another two connectors the same size, and from what I understand, that's all user-defined. Uh, as far as I can tell from what people say, it's just a whole bunch of extra pins you can use for whatever you want. So consequently, from what I've read, it ain't too healthy to go around just plug in compact PCI cards into any old chassis. You really uh, want to get something that's certified to work with the one you're putting it in. I, I suspect it's not even safe uh, to swap cards between two chassis from the same manufacturer. I mean, you're not really supposed to do that, I, I don't think. It, maybe the compact PCI people think you should, but it sounds like the vendors don't really care. They want you to buy a whole complete system, and then if you need uh, more parts for it, you're just supposed to call them, and they send you something that's meant to work with your particular unit. I suspect the same is true for things like a PC-104. There's probably a lot of weird custom stuff going on that's not documented anywhere. And since this isn't a particularly sexy computing topic, you don't find a lot of people sharing info about it online. So yeah, I uh, probably wouldn't take too many risks with this stuff. Now, I've been doing an awful lot of talking about compact PCI in general, but we should probably take a look at the actual computer that we're here to see today. Uh, so I showed you this earlier, but let's take a closer look. No, literally, let's just take a closer look. 
So what we have here is an entire PC on a single card. This is a, a CPU, memory, uh, chipset, etc. And then these other two cards are a hard drive and a floppy drive. Now, from what I understand, those were both optional. They sold this card itself, which is the uh, ZT6501B, on its own, and it came with a bezel that was only that wide. On that point, I forgot to look this up for the video, but I have to assume this is a uh, 3U card because, well, this guy here seems to be the smallest CPCI card they make, and it is exactly one third the width. And since the screw spacing and everything is standardized, I have to believe that they call these horizontal units. I'd be shocked if they didn't. So anyway, you could get this with uh, the 1U, 2U, or 3U faceplate, depending on which options you wanted. Uh, obviously, the uh, floppy drive for a lot of industrial applications would be unnecessary because you'd just image the hard drive and away you go. You'll never need to work on it in the field. If anything goes wrong, you're just going to replace the hard drive wholesale. And likewise, in a lot of applications, you wouldn't need the hard drive at all. You'd either be booting off of the network or uh, solid state storage or who knows what. So I think in a lot of applications, people probably did buy just the compute module itself. Now, the closest thing that I've found to a date of manufacture on here uh, is this sticker on what appears to be the BIOS chip, which says copyright 1999. And given that this machine was running Windows 2000, it, it feels pretty appropriate that this thing is from about 99, 2000 or thereabouts. Otherwise, I think it might have been running um, XP embedded or something like that. Uh, but I also think it just might have been a newer generation of hardware if that were the case, because this thing is pretty dated. Uh, Pentium 266 uh, is one of the fastest classic Pentiums that Intel ever made. Now, this doesn't say whether it's the MMX variant or not. I guess maybe I can find out when we turn it on. Uh, but... In fact, this is faster than any desktop Pentium, if I'm not mistaken. I believe they only went up to 233 megahertz, only in the MMX variant, and the 266 means that it has to be either a mobile or embedded version. Can't exactly remember my entire Pentium lineage, but I think that's right. I absolutely adore the little heat sink on here. This is, in fact, a tiny heat sink. It's got uh, little fins over there, and uh, while it's a piece of sheet metal on top, uh, if you look closely, you can see this actually is like a die cast, uh, aluminum, zinc, magnesium, whatever it is, sink. Uh, and this fan here was, was presumably custom made for it. Really lovely little thing. I can't remember how loud it is. We'll find out when we fire it up. But we could guess that that's a, a mobile or embedded processor under there that's just like BGA'd to the board. There's certainly no socket on here. Now, next up, we've got the RAM, and that is a very interesting situation. This has 128 megs of RAM, which is quite a bit for a classic Pentium machine. Of course, when you get into the later era of it, when it was being used as an embedded processor like this, well, I, I mean, theoretically, you could have up to four gigs of RAM, I believe, on any of the Intel CPUs, going back to the 386, right? Um, I, I think there was some wiggle room there, some like reserved space in the address range or something like that, but it's not remarkable that they were able to put that much RAM on there. Uh, it's just weird to actually see it, especially because the Pentium CPU predates the first generation of what we usually call uh, SDRAM, the the sticks with the two notches in them, right? Uh, those showed up with the uh, Pentium 2, I want to say. Don't quote me on that one. Um, but in this era, Pentium machines, uh, generally speaking, used EDO RAM, and this one's no different, which means it has the very rare, to me, 72-pin SODIMs. I have never seen these in anything else. Like, the laptops that I've gotten from this era rarely had SODIMs. They would have weird proprietary memory modules. So... This just looks super weird to my eyes. There's no notch. <laughs> and look how wide the contacts are. They're enormous. And apparently, this is 64 megs of EDO RAM. There's uh, two sticks in there to make 128. That's, that's an absurd amount of memory <laughs> for this format. You know what? I have not checked what might be under this chip, if anything. It's probably nothing remarkable. Oh, yeah. I don't even know what that stuff is. I'm not even going to bother looking it up. Uh, you can look it up if you want. There's the, the chip numbers. They're, I'm sure they're just jelly bean stuff you'd find on any motherboard. Oh, incredible. Great news. Great news. This machine will not have 128 megs when I fire it up because when I went to put the stick in, it snapped off both of the retention tabs. So I'm going to have to uh, bodge something together <laughs> to hold that in later. You know what? You know what? No, let's gaff tape it. Boy, there's nothing I love more than breaking a computer live on camera. No, no, buddy, I'm, I'm sure this stuff is ESD safe. It's no big deal. Calm down. Yeah, yeah, there we go. That won't cause any problems. Anyway, getting back to it. So what's interesting about this board is what it doesn't have. An awful lot of industrial computers have every single function they can possibly imagine packed into them, but this really doesn't have very much. 
We've got the CPU itself. We have an Ethernet controller, of all things. There's actually a 10100 Ethernet built into this thing. We've got the North and South Bridge, just the BIOS, obviously. I have no idea what that is. That also says BIOS on it. Hmm, does this thing have two BIOS chips? Don't know. And somewhere on here, there must be a Super I.O. controller that's providing the floppy and hard drive interfaces, serial parallel, USB, mouse, keyboard, that sort of thing. Uh, but that's it. There's nothing else going on in this thing, uh, including no video. It has no onboard graphics at all. We'll uh, get to that in a moment. It's very strange to me to see an industrial PC that doesn't have gobs of uh, fully integrated functionality. But the thing is, what intrigues me about Compact PCI is that it's basically just like normal PCI. You are expected to build up a PC yourself out of the core machine and then peripherals. And that's exactly what they did here. So it all makes perfect sense. Uh, it's just sort of weird to me as a, a budding connoisseur of little guys. The only other notable thing on here, which I'm sure you've noticed, is the BIOS battery. That is what that is. And it's soldered to the board on legs that hold it up above these two chips because they just plumb ran out of space. I mean, where else would you put it? It might have been possible to fit it on the back. There's actually some real estate back there, but um, actually, I guess I, I don't know why they didn't do that, but they certainly couldn't have put a holder on there. There's uh, no place for it. And there's vertical holders, but then it would have stuck out and run into one of the other cards. So what can you do? Oh, I, I guess there probably is one more question I should answer about this. Where do you plug everything in? I, I just finished saying it's got parallel serial USB, etc. but where is it all? Well, for one thing, like I mentioned, the sticker here says it's equipped with rear panel IO, which I assume means that all the ports are routed through this connector. And if we had the appropriate chassis, uh, we could just plug into them back there. But what if you don't have that chassis? Well, that's where this guy comes in, which is very bad news if you don't have the appropriate cable. Fortunately, we do. And is it ever a doozy? This is the most cursed breakout cable I've ever seen in my life. We've got parallel to serial, AT keyboard, um, USB, and then a mouse plug for a PS2 mouse, except I swear that icon is for Mac serial. I'm pretty sure. I, I know it's not for the mouse. So I, I think they had this manufactured by a company that just already had molds for making Mac serial cables uh, and just went ahead and reused them. I'm not gonna think about it anymore. The important thing is you are never gonna find one of these that terminates in a connector like that. Uh, this is a thing that's, uh, I don't know if this is the official term for it, but I always saw this referred to as DMS-59. And the only place I've ever seen it used was in small form factor uh, office PCs. Back in the early to mid 2000s, uh, companies like Dell and HP would make these uh, little tiny small form factor PCs for offices. And they'd put like real graphics cards in them and they'd wanna get multiple monitors out of them. Uh, but back then, I, I don't think we had mini display port yet and you couldn't fit multiple DVIs or VGAs or even HDMIs onto the uh, low profile cards that they often had in those machines. And so they'd use one of these and it would break out to either two DVIs, uh, two VGAs or a DVI and a VGA. And I always hated them when I was working e-waste because not that we didn't have millions of them, but they're just really, really bulky and heavy and fragile. Uh, you can very easily snap off one of the very tiny pins uh, on here in that connector and then the connector's trashed. Uh, and it's always just hanging off the thing. Like you can sort of see just how much weight is on there. And the ones for the graphics cards weren't much better. Screwing them in sucked, unscrewing them sucked. I never liked this connector. But at least I had plenty of the cables. Here, if I ever damage this, this thing basically goes in the trash. But hey, I, I can't think of a better way they could have done it. You know, it's, it's a single connector. It gets you everything you need, uh, except of course for video. Like I said, this thing has no onboard video and that's where we get into the peripherals. So we've got three cards here. Uh, we'll start with the uh, video card. This is it. This is a Ziatek ZT6631. And this is a very basic, uh, what we used to call SVGA card. Uh, this has a Chips and Technologies, uh, what is this, GD5446 on it. I don't know what the specs are on that, but I'd be shocked if it couldn't do 1280 by 1024 in 16-bit color. It, it might do better, but I wouldn't be surprised if that's as far as it goes, because for this sort of application, you're not gonna be gaming, you're not gonna be playing you know, HD video or anything. Uh, just getting a desktop at a decent resolution is probably good enough, as long as you're not stuck with like 256 color mode. So of course these down here are gonna be your VRAM chips. Uh, this here is probably 
uh, a prom for the VGA BIOS, I would guess. And there's not a whole lot else on there. This is just about the simplest uh, PCI graphics card you can get. Makes sense for this application. But it does have one interesting feature, literally. In addition to the VGA connector for plugging in a monitor, you also have a feature port. And I'm pretty sure that's a Visa feature interface. Uh, this is something I'm gonna do a video about at some point. But uh, in short, these appeared on video cards in this era uh, from like 1992 or three up through like uh, 2002, something like that. And what they allowed you to do was to put usually a MPEG-2 decoder card in a PC. And then when you played a DVD, it would offload the decoding of the video to that card. But if the decoded frames had to get sent across the PCI bus in order to get into the graphics card, then you'd run into bus contention issues and uh, you might drop frames. So instead, the feature connector allowed the decoder card to just spit the decoded frames straight into video RAM. Really neat, and it makes a lot of sense if that's what this is because, well, you can imagine somebody actually building like a DVD player out of commodity PC parts and needing a hardware decoder card. It does make me wonder if Zia Tech made a card like that and just had a little um, uh, cable like this because I'm never gonna find what plugs in there. So <laughs> I gotta go looking for one. Anyway, moving on, uh, next up, we've got an ethernet card which is intriguing because uh, the computer itself already had an Ethernet interface, yet they've added another one. Uh, this is uh, another digital uh, 10100 fast Ethernet chip, just like what's on the other guy. And otherwise, it's a completely ordinary Ethernet card. And then finally, and this one intrigues me a bit more, this is your SCSI controller. I guess they must have needed a SCSI drive for this thing, though knowing what it was being used for, I have no idea why. But this has a completely ordinary Adaptec uh, AIC7880 totally normal, fast slash wide SCSI controller, but the connectors intrigue me. On the end of this thing, we've got a completely normal 68 pin SCSI connector. Then on the inside, we have a 50 pin internal connector for the, um, the older style uh, eight bit SCSI, I think is what it is. Uh, and then we have this guy, and the manual doesn't quite say what this is. It just describes it as a shielded external connector and an unshielded internal connector. Well, I think they're the same plug, but it doesn't, it doesn't have the right shape. You see how this is a trapezoidal? A standard 68-pin uh, SCSI cable is also trapezoidal, but this is square. The pins look like they're in the right places, though, so let me see if I have a cable. See, the trouble is, I, I don't think the gender of the connector is, is right. Yeah, no, it isn't. See, this is normal 68-pin SCSI, and that will plug in there just fine. Mm -hmm. But nothing's gonna plug in there. Do I have a, a Terminator here? Uh, let's see, let's see. Uh, that's not a Terminator, but uh, will that fit? Eh, that's really awkward. Here's a Terminator, but again, wrong gender. Here we go. Uh, this connector might be uh, close enough to the bottom of the board that it'll fit in there. Let's see. Eh, no, this, this front panel gets in the way. Can I take that off? I think I can take that off. I won't be on this detour very long, don't worry. Okay, here we go. Let's see if this works. Uh, yeah, so even that's not sufficiently low profile. So you would have needed a special cable in order to, to get it close enough to the board, but it looks like it would fit a normal 68 pin SCSI connector. So I guess that um, uh, much like the wacky breakout cable, they probably provided their own custom cords just for connecting uh, to this thing, which makes sense because uh, while external SCSI is useful, probably you could buy hard drive carriers that would go into one of these slots. In fact, I would bet that's why there's this big negative space in the middle here. There's gotta be accessories that mount in one of these chassis but don't actually uh, take advantage of the back plane. Anyway, um, let me get all this out of here. You'll have to forgive me a few tangents now and then. All right, good as old. So as I was saying, what's remarkable about this is just how unremarkable it is as a PC, that is. All this hardware is bog standard, totally normal for a Pentium class machine in the late days of that platform. And the only thing that makes it interesting is that it's in a strange shape. I'll, um, I'll riff a little bit on why that shape uh, could be interesting to some people near the end of this video. But for the moment, let's plug it in, make sure it still works and I haven't ruined it, uh, and turn it on. Why, why won't it go in? Oh, because I put the wrong card into the slot. It's really easy to feed the hard drive carrier instead of the actual PC into the card guide and then that happens. You might be curious about the fasteners. There are an awful lot of screws in this thing. Obviously it's got a million screw holes up here so you can put a lot of screws in every one of these. 
Uh, it doesn't really seem like you need to unless it's uh, going into a high vibration environment which this was intended to, uh, but these all have these little latches on here that snap in to the square cutouts uh, in the ridge up here. Let me just show you that real quick. They tab in here and it retains the cards pretty positively and allows you to pop them out pretty positively as well. So if you were just messing around with this as a hobbyist, you uh, wouldn't need to really bother with the screws. Now I don't think it matters which order I put these in in, just like PCI, any slots as good as any other, I think. One thing I really love about this is just how quickly it all goes together. Bam, I just built a PC. That took 20 seconds. Oh, I should mention before I uh, plug this in, when I got this machine, I had a lot of trouble getting it working. Um, it would power on, the fans would spin, but nothing would come out, no beep, no video. Uh, and then after I tried it a few times, it suddenly posted and it worked. And then it went back into a coma again. I, I could not figure out what was going on. And finally, I realized that if this was plugged in, the machine wouldn't post which is kind of a problem because I sort of need this to plug in my keyboard and stuff. And I realized eventually, if you look very closely here, there's a reset button right there, a little pinhole right next to this guy. And I could see that it was tucked under the faceplate a little bit. The board had gotten shifted just a tiny bit. And so when I plugged this in and screwed it all the way down, it would compress the faceplate and squeeze the reset button a certain number of people in the audience are remembering a particular incident that occurred with <laughs> global scale network equipment manufacturer Cisco some years ago, where they had a network switch whose reset button was positioned right above one of the ethernet ports, right where the boot on the jacket would press it when you plugged it in, factory resetting the switch. And their solution for this was, don't do that. Class act, Cisco. Anyway, I fixed this by just realigning the button, and uh, I don't think I'll have any more trouble with it. He says, oh, I hate putting this thing in. Like I said, there's so much weight dangling off this that I, I tried uh, driving the jack screws in with a flathead and just uh, tore out one of the wings, so I can't do that anymore. And then I tried to use a, a pair of pliers and just completely wore down the ridges on it, so you can only really do it with fingers now, and oh, <laughs> this sucks. You know what? You know what? Gaff. I just dropped my roll of gaff tape behind the shelving unit with three tons of crap on it. May God have mercy on my soul. There we go. There we go. Problem solved. There we go. All right. Let me turn on my capture rig over here. Knock the front right off of it. Should probably dust that. All right, VGA goes in there. Well, VGA comes out there. All right, I'm not sure where my AT keyboard adapters are, so I'm just gonna use an actual AT keyboard. Hopefully it's not XT. This thing does have USB, I, I did forget that fact. I don't think it works very well though. All right, I, I think that's everything. Let's hit it and see what happens. Okay, we're spinning up. I'm not seeing a picture yet. I've got this feeling that maybe, uh, maybe that reset button's getting pressed again. Hmm. Well, I have a scroll lock light now. Let's try this again. I think it's supposed to beep. Oh, oh, there we go. Now it's going. Oh, and you know what? That is a Pentium with MMX. That makes sense for a 266. I don't think it was possible for it to not be MMX. Uh, but it looks like um, all 120 megs of our RAM uh, came through. So I guess I didn't uh, kill that stick and uh, I guess the gaff tape worked. There's the SCSI BIOS looking for drives. Uh, hopefully we'll get into the BIOS here in a second. Uh, naturally, the uh, coin cell is dead, uh, so the BIOS lost its settings. I guess I'm going to have to desolder and replace that. All right, let's see what we have here. So it says we have a 3.25 gig hard drive. I'm guessing that's actually a, a 3.6. That seems more likely. If I had the right cable, I could certainly add two drives, but I don't remember seeing a second IDE connector in there, so I wonder if the second chain actually works. We have a section down here for flash drive, which is interesting. Huh. Select size of the onboard flash drive. I, I had never even noticed this. So one of those chips on there must have been a flash drive, but look how small it is. Uh, well, at, at least if this is set correctly, this is only um, just under four megs. I mean, there's definitely applications for that. Uh, storing configuration data for a machine that's otherwise immutable makes sense, but um, boy, that's, that's very little storage. But supposedly, 
it says it should show up as the P drive. Of course, I'm guessing you've got to have a driver loaded for that to work. Well, we'll look for it once we get into Windows. Also, there's an option in here. I, I guess you could just command the BIOS to wipe the flash disk. Certainly, I can imagine applications for that if it gets sufficiently corrupted, especially if you're running uh, like custom software on here that doesn't have like a normal format utility or doesn't use a normal uh, like DOS disk format, uh, then doing sort of a low level format here might be necessary. There's a console redirection feature. This is pretty common on industrial boards. I think some consumer boards have it too, but industrial boards always have the option to redirect the uh, text mode output to one of the serial ports uh, because indeed uh, there would be applications where you run this without a separate graphics card or where you need to get to it over um, a dial-up modem or that sort of thing. And the rest of this looks pretty straightforward. This is like a remarkably modern BIOS for a Pentium machine because, of course, um, this chip was developed circa 1996-97, but the BIOS is from three to four years later. Not finding anything spicy in here, really. Let's uh, go ahead and see if it'll still boot now. Sorry I'm looking off over here. I I've got like a 46-inch TV over there that's uh, the monitor for this thing. Don't quite have room up here for it. I'm still figuring out how to make the warehouse work for this kind of thing. All right. Windows 2000, advanced server, mind you, not even just workstation. I love to go to Denny's and see the whole Windows 2000 server family sitting down to a meal together. I think we're coming up on a minute at this point. We've been at this screen for a while. Oh, oh, there we go. Preparing network connections. Sorry, bud. All your friends are dead. The time or date on your system is invalid. No, Windows 2000, I took you back in time 11 years. Only you can save the world. Okay. Here we are. Let's see if our mouse works. Ooh, not very well. Gosh, um, one moment. I need a better surface. Rip? Oh, well, that works surprisingly well. Uh, but also, uh, you can see actually everything you need to see because uh, this is what this thing does. You see this uh, Sky X business that's going on? When you start this thing, it runs a batch file, which um, puts a, a whole bunch of routes into the route table. Uh does some stuff. I don't know exactly what it's doing. From what I understand, this thing was uh, like a shop unit, a, a prototype or something, uh, for testing an in-flight internet product that Boeing was trialing back uh, around the, the turn of the millennium. In fact, on top, it's got a asset tag that says connection by Boeing. Cool picture of that up there. And that's all I know. I did some Googling. I couldn't find a whole lot of info about it. Nothing I felt compelling enough to share with you. I'm pretty sure it's what I said though, uh, like a, an in-flight uh, internet access product. And this SkyX thing was like the, uh, the satellite gateway service I think they went with. And that's virtually everything that I know about it. It starts up, it runs this listener process. It says the uh, SkyX listener is bound to an IP address on port 55666. That's nothing normal. Then on the drive, there's nothing other than uh, a blank copy of Microsoft IIS. I guess they hadn't gotten around to putting in like the guest Wi-Fi login page or anything like that. This uh, ASF root thing, uh, I believe this is because this thing has Microsoft Windows Media Encoder on it. Indeed it does. Uh, presumably they would have used that to, I don't know, in-flight movies? I have no idea. I think all these files are just generic ones that come with Microsoft uh, uh, Windows Media Encoder, so nothing interesting there. Oh, I guess since I uh, uh, moved the cards around, it has to rediscover everything. Uh, you can go over there. Oh boy, this is not fast. Oh, it just occurred to me, I'm about to try to decode video on a Pentium 266. Well, it's got, it's got MMX. That should work. Oh boy, this thing's not fast. I, I guess it is a little busy trying to uh, reinstall all the hardware. Oh, okay, it's actually uh, playing this video clip. Although there's not a lot going on, I guess probably uh, the soundtrack might have been the more interesting part of this clip. Oh, we got ourselves a little countdown here. Is that what's going on? Oh, oh, oh. oh I got those radical uh, mid to late 90s uh, video effects. Oh boy, this thing is grinding. Let's take a look at our CPU utilization. It's probably getting absolutely hammered, the poor thing. Oh yeah, see the, the frame rate varying up and down? Ooh, it's slammed. Oh, but it, you know what? Maybe it was actually the, uh, the driver installations that were doing that because uh, now it's back down to a a reasonable amount and the uh, video is playing smoothly. Good work, Pentium 266. You're killing it over here. Anyway, like I said, all these files just come with Windows Media Encoder, um, so there's nothing specific to the product in here. And what's intriguing is there's actually literally nothing specific to what this was doing on here because uh, this stuff here, the SkyX software, uh, is just a generic package that would have been downloaded from their website, uh, it looks like. It just has like a general 
consumer looking readme in here. It uh, it actually never really says what it does. I, I think you're supposed to already know if you have it. It's like a whole bunch of files in here, but they seem to just be literally source code for writing your own software to interact with this thing, whatever it is, whatever it does. Uh, in the bin folder, we've got just uh, tons and tons of files. Uh, we've got an if config and a route.exe and a netstat.exe, which uh, those things were all part of Windows, uh, not just in, in NT here, but I, I think in 98, 95 as well, uh, which suggests that this might actually have had a replacement IP stack or something like that. I'm not really sure. The only information we can really suss out of this thing uh, is that uh, it was apparently made by a company called Mentat Inc. And this apparently came with the evaluation kit for the SkyX gateway system for Windows NT. It doesn't explain what that system does. Oh, wait, you know what? I'm sorry. It does say right there. Oof. We may not see all traffic from the site that is destined outbound to the satellite link. There you go. Okay. Whew. It is what I thought it was. And that's, that's all I can tell you about. I don't know anything about satellite uh, networking. I don't know anything about SkyX or Mentat. I never discovered anything interesting about them. And that is literally the only thing that's on here. The drive is otherwise totally empty, uh, except for a bog standard copy of Windows. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I lied to you. I did find something online when I looked this up a couple months ago. I found a picture of a Mentat SkyX gateway. There it is. Oh, and you know what? I actually did find a picture of the back of the thing, and that's also entertaining because, well, it's obviously just a 1U rack server that they bought off the shelf, and so uh, they didn't want people to plug anything into the wrong places. So if we look at the back here, they had somebody manufacture a custom little uh, like sheet metal cover that they put over everything that you shouldn't know about on the back of this thing. This is such a common thing in little guy manufacturers, but you don't usually see it this blatant. I love it. So that's pretty much the only intriguing software that's on this thing, so obviously we should probably add some of our own. But I am absolutely sick to death of people playing Doom. You'll never see me do it. So I got something much more interesting. Now this, this is real gaming. That's right, baby, it's Castle of the Winds! The best roguelike for the 16-bit Windows platform. Boy, that's taken a minute to load from that floppy disk. I absolutely adore this game. This was the first RPG I ever played uh, back in, in like 1995. I found this on a shareware disc uh, and played it on, on Windows 3.1. And I always loved it because the entire user interface looks like it's just made out of standard Windows icons, which to some extent I think it is. Strength, all the way. Intelligence, have you met me? Strength, more. Oh, no, it doesn't go anymore. All right, well then, Constitution. Perfect. Oh, wait a second, I never noticed this. The interface is built out of icons because you can actually load a custom character icon, presumably out of an ICO file. I love it. I'll take heal minor wounds. So, the reason that I picked uh, Castle of the Winds is because uh, it's, a really fascinating game to me. It has a lot of historical significance that uh, I think very few people realize. I never realized the whole time that I had this growing up that it was a roguelike. I didn't know what a roguelike was. I'd never heard of rogue. It's never been a fan of roguelikes once I found out what they were. So I never thought back to this thing and went, oh, I guess that's what that is. But uh, it has all of the characteristics of a roguelike because it's actually meant to be. I went and looked into the history of this game last night, uh, just out of the blue, and um, I found out that it had been written by one Rick Sada, I, I think is his name, who uh, originally played Rogue back in 1983 on, uh, I think, a PDP-11 uh, at Princeton, uh, and then when he got a job at Microsoft in 1986, uh, working on Word for DOS, I believe, uh, he decided he wanted to start making Windows software so he could break into that part of the company. Uh, and the way that he decided to learn how to write Windows applications was by porting Rogue, more or less, to Windows, uh, well, I guess at that point it would have been uh, 2.0, uh, and eventually, you know, upgrading it uh, in the Windows 3 era, and uh, I guess he continued working there into the Windows 95 era, and at some point just uh, decided to actually release the game. But for the longest time, this was just a program that was floating around inside Microsoft on their internal file share, on their network, uh, that every Microsoft employee had played, um, people were giving him feedback, etc. So this is sort of a foundational pillar of the history of Windows gaming, which I think I'd always realized on some level, because it was the only really serious native 
Windows game that I had back in the day, you know, that looked like it wasn't just a, um, a DOS game that had been updated to use the Windows graphics APIs, but uh, was in fact, you know, made using the native elements of Windows itself. How do I go downstairs? I don't remember. Verbs, climb down the stairs. A very long time passed between when I last played this game, you know, seriously, and when I played the original Rogue for the first time on a Z80-based machine running CPM, and found that it was, in fact, a hell of a lot more entertaining than I expected for a game of its vintage. <laughs> I think that's how most games of Rogue ended in the days before we started polishing the formula and making it a bit more um, player-friendly, if you will. But. It's still a really cool game, and finding out that it had uh, such a rich history was uh, really remarkable, so I thought uh, I'd share it with you all. Having said all that, <laughs> what do we think about this machine? Well, I think it's incredibly cool. This is uh, absolutely my favorite Pentium class machine that I own at this point. It's neat that it's a, a Pentium 266 with MMX. That puts it in a really interesting performance bracket. You go uh, too much further back to like the 486 and... Um, well, that won't even run Doom very well, uh, TBH, uh, let alone later games, let alone a lot of software uh, that you might be interested in if you're not trying to really live the experience of the time. That is, running a handful of text mode apps and the occasional uh, productivity program and um, just being used to your computer, taking a long time to open programs and to do pretty much everything. If you want to have a responsive experience with a computer doing anything even remotely modern, you really need to be up into this performance class. So it's neat that this one is. And there's a lot of things I could do with this um, if I were so inclined. For instance, it would be fun, just as a dorky idea, to track down another set of components to put in the second side here, including a network card, and uh, network the two machines and run a LAN game between them, right? LAN in a box. Love it, right? That'd be fun. But um, there's another thing that, well, I think about this every single time that I look at this machine, and I gotta believe that some of you have been too. It's the same dorky joke every single time I pull this thing out, and it goes like this. Huh, that's a pretty cool modular synth, bro. I like Eurorack too. It's a pretty good bit, but um, you're not gonna believe this. I don't even know what this does. Is Cell 2 the name of the thing or the manufacturer? Are these inputs? Is this a sequencer? These knobs aren't even labeled. Tell me this ain't a Euro rack component. My girlfriend left this here. Let's just get on with it. This might be the most ridiculous thing I've ever done with a computer, but look, it's not my fault that these fit perfectly. I mean, okay, let's be real. A couple of the modules I've tried uh, didn't actually fit because they run into the card guides at the top and bottom, but that's uh, easy enough to fix because, well, if you're doing this, then you can just remove uh, the guides from this side of the machine because you don't need them. But I should probably take a moment to explain what the hell I'm on about for all the people who have no idea what the joke is. Um, just a moment. This is a Eurorack modular synthesizer. This is notionally a, an instrument. The idea is if you want to make electronic music, but you're not satisfied with the sounds available and the stuff on the market from Korg and Moog and whatnot, you can build your own synth with whatever capabilities you like. So we've got a bunch of modules here with voltage controlled oscillators and amplifiers and filters, and you can just hook them up however you like with all these little tiny patch cables. These things are, are super popular with music nerds. Um, although, frankly, an awful lot of them never get around to the music making part and just sort of make weird noise with them. Mind you, it can be kind of tough to get anything resembling music out of these things. They're so finicky, but it can be done. You get the picture. I, I mean, this thing is huge, obviously. It's actually fairly modest as these things go, but you could absolutely make a, a functional one that's only four or five modules, and they would fit right there. I love it. I absolutely love it. But it's funny on multiple levels because, well, I just accidentally discovered a practical application for these things. I was going to do this riff at the beginning of the video where I said that uh, Compact PCI is one of those industrial technologies that makes nerds uh, just start drooling and we all just have to have it, but you don't need it. There's nothing it's going to do for you, but, well, um, this is kind of compelling, right? Because... I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but they went on to make newer versions of Compact PCI for much newer PCs. This one's from 99, but they're still making them. So 
you could probably go to eBay and find some piece of crap that isn't even labeled correctly that's got like an i3 6th gen in it or something like that. Build it up on one side of this thing, fill the other half with, you know, CV gate stuff and a MIDI converter and put your sequencer on the PC. Do I need to keep talking? That would be rad, right? I mean, it's rackable for Christ's sake. And on top of that, these power supplies, did I mention this, that there's no indication of what the uh, output voltages are? Did I say this earlier? Very weird, but you can bet that it's just 12, 5, and 3.3, which I think is the same thing you need for Eurorack synth components, so very probably you could modify the power supply to run your synth, and if you do this, and I know someone's going to, you have to tell me, you have to send me an electronic mail, cathoderaydude at gmail.com, with a link to the YouTube video, because it's gonna kick ass. And I should mention, this is no coincidence, okay? I said earlier that uh, Compact PCI is derived from the same base standards as VME bus, which in turn goes back to EuroCard. And the reason it's called EuroRack is because, if I'm not mistaken, it too derives from EuroCard, which specifies standard heights, standard rail dimensions, standard screw spacings, and so on. This was in fact a very likely outcome but I have the feeling that I'm the only person uh, anywhere who knows that you can do this. Now, a lot more people know. Go forth and do it. Just um, don't get mad at me if you burn down your house, because like I said, all this stuff on eBay, I don't know anything about it. You don't know anything about it. You probably can't get the manual from the manufacturer, so uh, be careful, Godspeed, use a voltmeter. But I think that makes this potentially the most useful little guy I've ever had in this series. So as an inauguration of the new season of little guys, I think this one takes the cake. I couldn't have picked a better option. Thank you all so much for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed this, and I really hope you did, because uh, I, I spent so much money putting together this warehouse hoping I could make videos like this. So I hope this was a good time for all. Uh, and if you're new to my channel, this is your first time seeing this, Hey, great, I intend to keep making stuff like this. So if you wanna see that keep happening, then uh, subscribe to my channel. Remember to turn on notifications so you can get updates when I release new stuff. And consider subscribing to my Patreon because, well, I have to pay for these things. Uh, my patrons uh, make it possible for me to do all this. This is my full-time job. They pay for the gadgets and the stuff I use to record the gadgets and the space to record the gadgets in and my groceries and gas for my car and everything else. So this would not be possible without them. Thank you all so much. Couldn't do this without you. To everybody else, thanks for watching.